We've come together today because of our work in this shared mission. And we'd like to welcome four individuals to share the reflection of how their work and ministry have been informed by the Congregation of Holy Cross. Sister Veronique Weedover is the Vice President of Mission at St. Mary's College. Mr. Andrew Polonecki is the Director of Campus Ministry at Holy Cross College. Ms. Ann Firth formerly served as an Associate Vice President of Student Affairs at Notre Dame and currently is the Chief of Staff to Notre Dame's President Reverend John Jenkins, CSC. And Mr. Christopher Haug, in addition to uh, chairing this Holy Cross pre-conference gathering, is an Assistant Director of Residence Life at Notre Dame. Please join me in welcoming our panelists for this afternoon's discussion. Well, thank you all for this invitation. It's always great to talk with my Holy Cross colleagues. Um, earlier in the year, I was asked to speak about the virtue of zeal and how it influenced my life as a Sister of the Holy Cross. Uh, I recalled that it's a virtue that I heard very little about uh, in my earlier years growing up, but I, that I experienced daily in the lives of my teachers and the Sisters of Holy Cross and the lay women who staffed the school that I attended. I think the same can be said about collaboration. It's a word that did not find its way into my vocabulary till about 1980 or somewhere along there. Uh, however, it's probably one of those um, virtues along with zeal and the spirit of hospitality that drew me to choose the Sisters of the Holy Cross as a community with which I wish to share life. In San Diego, California, where I grew up, the Sisters regularly included lay parishioners and many of us students in their ministry. They inserted themselves into the life of the community in which they served, and that was at a time when apostolic religious life carried on a lot more of monastic rules than it did of apostolic life. Uh, I spent many happy hours with the sisters working with other students, whether they need help with reading or the spelling list, or on Saturdays cutting out letters for the beautiful bulletin boards that graced our classrooms. And often this was done to the accompaniment of Notre Dame football games on the radio. Uh, it was much later in life that I learned that this kind of shared work was collaboration. Although my discernment to enter religious life had its ups and downs, uh, there was never a question in my mind about which community I would choose. The women of Holy Cross and the brothers and priests of Holy Cross I would learn later have a way of living life fully aroused by the spirit and tapping into the energy that pulsates within their own religious communities as well as in the communities of the people of God. It is this immersion, this collaboration, that has always made me feel at home in Holy Cross. In learning about the early history of the sisters in Indiana, it was no surprise to me that in Bertrand, Michigan, the original site of St. Mary's College, the sisters invited lay women to help with them with the teaching of students. As Sister Mary Immaculate Creek noted in her book, A Panorama, this collaboration established a cherished tradition of presence and contribution unbroken to the present day. In my history with the congregations of Holy Cross, this collaboration, while always present, has taken on many different textures. In the early years, it seems that collaboration was necessary for the sisters in order to carry out their mission. In Bertrand, for example, there was one professed sister, a teacher who spoke mainly French, four postulants, all who were American, but had very little teaching experience. The invitation for lay women to join with the St. Mary's venture was one of necessity if the school was to be successful. Gradually, however, the experience moved to the laity and sisters working with each other in shared ministry. This was my mission experience. The relationship was closer, but the institutions remained clearly ours. Today, perhaps because of the happy fault of fewer religious and fewer institutions, our practice and mindset is more of what I feel true collaboration is religious and laity, together in ministry, in governance, and in decision-making. The practice of including collaborators in our ministries naturally has helped 
at us to join with other collaborators in their works as we have branched out to different places and to new works. Wherever I have served, I have been enabled to know and to understand the importance of immersing myself in the church and the society, including people from many walks of life. It is immersed in this wonderful context that I have learned to delight in what I have been given and to nurture the, with passionate love the person I am becoming, as well as seeing the marvelous plan of God for this world. The philosophy of education that is promoted by Blessed Basil Morrow and generations of Holy Cross educators who follow in his footsteps call us to discover together the information that once shared forms our personal choices for life and opens us to the transforming graces of the spirit, which is then shared and communicated to others. Community colors and gives textures to the information that I as vice president for mission share and discover with my colleagues. It grounds the information in the college's mission and reality and invites an energetic and committed exchange of ideas and experiences. For all of us engaged in Holy Cross ministry and other ministries, lay and religious, it opens us to the pain and joys of our students, co-workers, and others. It opens us to the wonder of the cosmos and moves us to live in compassionate service to others, not in isolation, but together. In this way, it transforms us as well as the lives of those whose lives we touch. The charism of the Sisters of the Holy Cross is reflected in our Constitution, calls the membership to be responsible for creating a climate that promotes personal growth, openness to others, and the well-being and vitality of community. It's interesting to me that the word community is left purposefully ambiguous. Is the community the congregation, the sisters with whom one lives, the people that we immerse ourselves with in ministry? Is it the world community? The older I become, and hopefully the more mature in faith that I become, the wider the definition of community comes, becomes for me. Being a shy person doesn't give me an excuse, but challenges me to trans be transformed by the women and men with whom and for whom I minister, as well as those with whom I worship, share leisure, and live. Feeding my hunger for community does not happen in one sitting but is the quest of my lifetime. Sometimes I sit in solitude, and most often with companions, who support and encourage me, and stretch and challenge me. I'm blessed to sit with my sisters and brothers in community, married and single lay colleagues and friends, young and old, who come to share worship at the Church of Our Lady of Loretto and in the chapels at St. Mary's College who join hands in circles of solidarity on our campus greens, and who many, large and small, help us to build the St. Mary's family. How I choose to be in relationship today with my sisters in religious life and with the men and women with whom I work each day at the college enables me to more easily resist the temptation to sink into what some have called an unlived life of becoming overwhelmed with the enormity of the task of the world and becoming paralyzed. For me, living collaboratively feeds a hunger within me and allows me to grow. It helps me to remember that the work of life is not mine alone, but is, as Father Moreau says, the work of God, a God who is imaged by the trinity of community. It means I pay attention live in the present moment, and allow myself to be moved by the wonder and beauty of creation. It also helps me to see the great and small manifestations of God that I encounter each day, especially in the lives of those who surround me. Especially students help me to incarnate an attitude of gratitude, to laugh, and to constantly marvel at the variety of gifts in this world. The mission of the college states that we promote intellectual vigor, aesthetic appreciation, 
religious sensibility, and social responsibility as we continue to assess our response to the complex needs and challenges of our contemporary world. That we are a community where women develop their talents and prepare to make a difference in the world. In my years at the college, both as a member of the Board of Trustees, as a student, as a campus minister, and now as Vice President for Mission, I see that St. Mary's students not only prepare to make a difference, but daily make a difference in the way they engage one another, the faculty and staff in the larger South Bend community. Their lives promote justice, respect diversity, and promote sustainable quality of life. Their leadership and governance of themselves and their care and compassion in times of joy and sorrow hearten me. I see mutuality in the way the collaborative spirit of faculty, staff, and administration, religious and lay, spills over to the students and from the students to us as we jointly stretch our minds and hearts in gospel living. I think Father Moreau would say that by teaching an example, we promote a life of unity, interconnectedness, and collaboration, which moves the conviction of our hearts to the action of our hands in loving and compassionate service. Personally, it's one of the reasons I chose to join in Holy Cross. It caught my imagination all those long years ago in San Diego, and it continues to feed me as I try to be a bearer of hope today. Thank you. Thank you, sister. One summer in the early 90s, Notre Dame College Prep in Niles, Illinois, which at that time was Notre Dame High School for Boys and run by the Congregation of Holy Cross, was going through some renovation projects. As a poor Catholic school running a tight budget should, the high school was looking for ways to do things cheaply and so asked for volunteers to come that summer and paint renovated classrooms. I'm not surprised that my mother quickly volunteered me to go help as she was always looking for ways to get her four children out of the house and occupied during the summer months. Plus, for years as a kid, I had taken carpentry classes at the local Chicago Park District, and so painting for me was an enjoyable pastime that I was at least moderately good at. Now, I was not a student yet at Notre Dame High School, but both of my older brothers were, and so I was somewhat familiar with that place. I felt a bit strange and uneasy, and probably a bit nervous walking up to ring the doorbell on the far wing of the school that people called the priest's residence. It was a Tuesday evening at 6 p.m., and at my side was my trusty homemade wooden toolbox stocked with new paintbrushes. One of those guys dressed in black with a white collar opened the door, and I mumble, I'm Dan and Chris's little brother, Andrew, and I'm here to paint. I look up at the large grin of my greeter as he steps to the side and says, Ah, good, I'm Father Ken. Let me get you set up in a classroom. Do you need a Coke? That Tuesday evening, as I walked down the hallway next to Father Ken Molinero, CSC, was the first time I intimately shared in the workings and mission of the Congregation of Holy Cross. And as, maybe as you read in my bio, except for my six-year stint where I was being educated and working for the Jesuits, may God and all of you forgive me, <laughs> I have been learning from or working with Holy Cross ever since. Like many others and many of you in this room, I have spent countless hours in thought and conversa conversation trying to figure out exactly what it was that drew me in. Sometimes I say what suckered me in to this life where I basically see it as my vocation to be using my gifts and talents to work with the Congregation of Holy Cross and support its mission of educating minds and hearts. Of course, there are all kinds of moments and experiences and interactions a touch of the heart of being drawn into this mission of Holy Cross. But I'd like to share with you something I heard a Holy Cross priest say just a few weeks back regarding how Father Moreau understood the growth of faith. I think this insight very clearly gets at what Holy Cross means to me and why I feel called to work side by side with Holy Cross. The priest explained that Basil Moreau saw people discovering faith through the person of Christ and specifically through the person of Christ that is modeled in individuals. In other words, faith Moreau, for Moreau can't grow in a vacuum or because of some well-articulated rational theological argument, but rather faith grows when one encounters Christ within individuals that are role models. So looking back at my Notre Dame High School experience, I can recall a group of joyful men that taught me, coached me, shared meals with me. They asked me about my family, 
They cared for me. They loved me. They taught me about God, not just in theology class, but by the way they lived, the way they worked, and the way they laughed. I saw these men as smart men, and some of them were even the first geniuses that I had ever met. They were all good teachers. Some were a bit crustier than others, but I always felt and believed that they all had a genuine interest in me as a person. These men were my heroes, and although I might not have thought about it this way at the time, they were saintly heroes, for in them I was finding Christ and learning to love Christ and his church. I remember going home one day during Lent of my junior year and saying to myself as a 16-year-old kid, these guys have something, something special, and I want it too. It was this desire that led me to old college, where I, in a formal way, was able to discern a religious life with the congregation. During my college years, as I grew in a life of faith and prayer, my discernment led me away from religious life and ultimately to marriage. But I realized that what I saw on Holy Cross was something that I could still share in as a layperson. I learned that I could still be a student and product of Moreau, or as Bishop Jenke said, a, a spiritual son of Moreau and embrace some of these traits that make up the charism of Holy Cross. Like the CSCs that I've encountered throughout my life, I've grown to try and be a, zeal to be a man who is zealous in my work of sharing the gospel. I try to place my trust in divine providence. I attempt to be generous and hospitable. I model my own family life after the Holy Family. I have a genuine interest in people, particularly the students that I work with on a daily basis at Holy Cross College. And of course, every day, I pray to have the strength to place all my hope at the feet of Jesus on the cross. Ave crux, spazunica. I try to model Christ in the way and manner that Holy Cross religious modeled Christ during my formative and transformative years of high school and college. Men and women religious of, Holy, of the Congregation of Holy Cross Thank you for modeling Christ in your life. Thank you for walking the streets side by side with ordinary people. Thank you for coming to my home to share a meal or to play baseball in the backyard with my boys. Thank you for meeting the needs of the day, whatever that need may be. Thank you for being a visible sign of God's love in the world. Thank you for helping me and teaching me not to be just a successful citizen of this world, but also, hopefully with God's good grace, putting me on the straight path to be a successful citizen of the next world. We gather today in the shadow of the Golden Dome here on the campus of the University of Notre Dame. People say this place is special. They say that anyone who spends time here, even if it is brief, they leave changed. Some explain this and call it the Notre Dame spirit or the Notre Dame family. Well, those are fine and I get those, but I believe resting at the heart and foundation of all that is true good and beautiful about Notre Dame is the Holy Cross spirit in the Holy Cross family. And what makes this place unique, you'll find at every Holy Cross parish, ministry, and institution across this country and around the globe. It is because of the Holy Cross spirit and the Holy Cross family that I work at Holy Cross College and why I particularly find meaning and fulfillment in my life and work. So one final story I'd like to share. During the month of May of 2011, I traveled with 16 Holy Cross students to Ghana, West Africa. Holy Cross students participate in a global experience where they have the opportunity to work with and live with Holy Cross religious in various parts of the world. And I was ecstatic to be part of this trip as I was eager to see the work of the Congregation of Holy Cross and the missions for the first time. Many of us, many of us have stories of difficult travel experiences but I'm willing, willing to bet the journey to the Holy Cross District Center in Brafayao, Ghana, ranks up there as one of the most exhaustive and draining. There was the bus ride to O'Hare, then a flight to Germany, then a nine-hour layover, then a, lo a long flight to Accra, the capital of Ghana. There was the nearly four hours of night travel on a bumpy, pothole-infested road. To say I was quite hungry at this point is an understatement, and my lungs were hurting from breathing the hot and humid air that was thick and nasty from diesel exhaust. It was the middle of the night, and we unpacked the vans in a downpour. Before heading to bed, we were offered a snack, which initially gave me hope, but whatever it was that we were offered, it didn't match up to the Mickey D's fries and cheeseburger that my mouth watered for. As I lay in my bed with a wet towel on my chest to try and make the hot room a bit more bearable, I eventually drifted off to sleep, 
feeling decently miserable and just a bit guilty that I left my pregnant wife home with our two boys to fend for herself for the next 17 days. I hate to sound like a wimp as I tend to think of myself as pretty tough. After all, I played sports, I backpacked in the northern jungles of Thailand, lived with an aboriginal community in the outback of Australia, and survived six years of teaching high school. <laughs> anyway, I woke up the next morning with the sun shining into my room and a fairly decent breeze coming through the open window. I walked out on the third floor veranda and was struck by the beauty of the place. I looked out at the well landscaped property of the district center and then glanced over at the entranceway we had driven through the previous night. My heart leapt for joy and a grin came across my face as I realized that standing there welcoming me to that faraway land was my good and dear friend, Brother Andre. The darkness of the previous evening had kept the statue hidden, but that next morning I could see him standing there as the greeter and friend of all who entered that place. Flashes of his statue at Notre Dame High School raced through my head, as did his gentle and tender hands that reach out to you as you approach him here at the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. I recall the many times I knelt and put my forehead on the cold marble of his tomb at the oratory in Montreal, and almost could feel my wife's hand in mine as I remembered standing with her in St. Peter's Square as he was raised to the altar by Pope Benedict. With new vigor, I bounded down the stairs to the meal room on the first floor. As I went in the door, there was Brother Ken Good and Brother Danielle Dardot sitting there sipping their coffee with their familiar metallic cross and acres hanging around their necks. Brother Ken smiled, greeted me, told me to grab some coffee and have a seat. As I settled into the chair at their table, I was able to relax and make myself comfortable. For this foreign place was now home as I could sense its Holy Cross spirit and found the Holy Cross family living there. So I'd just like to finish with these words of Father Moreau. Such are our plans, my dear sons and daughters in Jesus Christ. If we put no obstacles in the way of his designs, God will bless them. For he himself has inspired whatever has been undertaken up to the present for the completion of this important work. Yes, I have the firm confidence that God will bless our educational program since he is giving us the means to realize it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. As Dan mentioned, my name is Ann Firth, and it's really my joy to be with you today to talk about Holy Cross, which is so near and dear to my heart, and I know the hearts of all who are gathered here. It's been my great privilege over the past 30 years to work alongside the women and men of Holy Cross as they live out Blessed Basil Moreau's call to educate the heart, both at Notre Dame and in their various other apostolates. Like my fellow panelists, my experience as a lay collaborator, I think, is both uniquely personal to me and in some sense wonderfully universal. And I think that we all have stories to share about the women and men of Holy Cross who have touched our lives. Andrew spoke so movingly about this, about the ways that we see Holy Cross lived out in the individuals we encounter. As an undergraduate at Notre Dame, I first became aware of the priests of Holy Cross through the thought-provoking homilists who preached at Mass in Walsh Hall here on campus, Father Bill Tuohy, Father Don McNeil, and Monk Malloy, to name a few. The first Holy Cross priest I really came to know well was Father Mike McCafferty, who was my professor at Notre Dame Law School and an important mentor. Father David Tyson hired me into my first job at Notre Dame in 1985 as the university's inaugural director of the Office of Residence Life. And because he believed in me, I discovered my vocation as an educator and university administrator. Father Andre Levier can celebrated at my wedding 27 years ago, baptized each of our five children in the log chapel here on campus, and ministered to my parents in the final months of their lives. Sister Mary Louise Goody was a longtime colleague in student affairs and a trusted mentor and friend. So as you can see, I have a lot of history, personal and professional, with Holy Cross, from my young adulthood to the present. And I have considered it one of the great privileges of my life to work alongside so many Holy Cross priests, brothers, and sisters who serve as rectors, administrators, teachers, and pastors. As Dan mentioned, I currently work in the president's office uh, alongside Father Jenkins. 
He is an extraordinary leader who navigates the complex waters of being president of Notre Dame while living out his vocation as priest in the truest sense. I, won't, I don't have time, nor would I mention all of the folks in Holy Cross I've come to know and love over the years, but there are so many of them, uh, and their examples and ministry have had the most profound influence on me. I honestly cannot imagine my life without these colleagues and friends. Again, I'm guessing most all of us have similar stories to share. And so I really offer my reflections today on behalf of all of us and with heartfelt gratitude for the many ways that Holy Cross has inspired, mentored, and challenged me and so many others. I'd like to just touch on two notions, two life lessons I've learned through my association with Holy Cross as a lay collaborator. I know these are probably themes that others have touched on or will touch on over the course of, the, of these sessions, but I think these are ones that really stand out to me. The first is the true meaning of hospitality. So often in our culture, we speak of hospitality as a kind of universal and kind of even banal congeniality. As the theologian Henry Nouwen describes it, tea parties, bland conversations, and a general atmosphere of coziness. The Greek word, for, Greek word for hospitality is philozenos, which means love of strangers, implying a much more profound relationship between host and those who are being, who are being welcomed. As counterpoint to the very popular, to the popular understanding of the word, now and offers a very different definition of hospitality, and this is the one I have seen lived out in Holy Cross. The author of an offer of a space where change can take place, a space where a stranger can enter and become a friend, instead of an enemy. This concept of hospitality fits well with what I've heard Professor Larry Cunningham describe as the purpose of an education of the heart, namely the linking of the growth in knowing with the enlargement of that interior space where rests the image and likeness of God. As that space within each of us is enlarged, our capacity to meet others where they are, to extend ourselves with genuine openness in ways that are authentically hospitable, grows by leaps and bounds. To enter as stranger and become friend instead of enemy implies not only conversation but also conversion, both of the person being welcomed and the person who is welcoming. It's the transformation described in Ephesians. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the holy ones and the members of the household of God. This transformation is also described beautifully in the constitutions of Holy Cross. Christ was anointed to bring good news to the poor, release for prisoners, sight for the blind, restoration for every broken victim. Our efforts, which are his, reach out to the afflicted and in a preferential way to the poor and the oppressed, we come not just as servants, but as their neighbors, to be with them and of them. As reflected in these passages, the ultimate goal of hospitality is the creation of community. Our efforts to extend hospitality, then, are an important barometer of the state of our hearts, both as individuals and as, as a collective. In the course of my own work at Notre Dame, I find myself reflecting often on how I might more fully embody this spirit of welcome. How can I, to paraphrase the words of the Holy Cross Constitutions, be with and of those I serve? This is both my duty and my privilege. My life's work, certainly, but also a grace-filled debt I owe for the many ways Notre Dame and Holy Cross have shaped me. And so I ponder regularly how I might become more hospitable, more generous, more loving in matters great and small. In my reflections on this, I'm inspired by my colleagues, both lay and in Holy Cross, and most especially by the students themselves. In this sense, I find myself moving always from the one who is teaching to the one being taught and back again. I still think often about something Father Griffin, a Holy Cross priest who had a regular observer column, wrote when I was an undergraduate. I have never found a person whom I needed to love, whom I couldn't love, if I am patient enough. The second notion I want to touch on is that of stewardship, especially as it relates to the work of educating the heart and mind. Some years ago, I was working on a project with a Holy Cross co priest colleague. In the midst of the project, one of his closest friends, also a Holy Cross priest, who had been ill with cancer for many months, passed away. Out of deference for his loss, I offered to reschedule a series of listening sessions which were to take place in the evening on the day of his friend's funeral. My friend said to me, Anne, 
the best way I can honor the memory of my beloved friend and brother in Holy Cross is to continue to do God's work here on earth. This was an important witness to me. The image that came to mind was that of laborers in the vineyard, each contributing in unique and important ways, but understanding that the whole, namely the building up of God's kingdom, was greater than the sum of the parts. The work that each of us does with students in service to the various institutions we serve is given to us in trust. It is ours to do for a time, to serve humbly and to lead wisely, and then to hand off to those who will follow us, hopefully leaving the work better than when we took it up. It is this awareness of the larger enterprise that I see lived out in Holy Cross every day, and it is this same awareness that I seek to cultivate both in my work life and in my prayer life. Finally, a last observation. One of the things I love most about Holy Cross is that they are women and men of action. Theirs is a commitment to being a force for good in very real and practical ways, wherever they find themselves. They are by nature self-effacing and not likely to spend a lot of time talking about all the incredible things they are doing. One of the ways that I believe I and all of us who have been formed by Holy Cross can repay what we have received is by helping them to tell their story through our actions and our words. I thank God for the men of, and women of Holy Cross and they, the ways they shape all of us to be people with hope to bring. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. It's no surprise to my friends and colleagues who know me uh, that they're clearly aware St. Andre, like Andrew, is among my favorite saints. And I, I sit before you today with an opportunity to share how the Congregation of Holy Cross has informed my work in student affairs. My start here at Notre Dame was actually in housing, where I coordinated the summer housing program. Last night, before heading to bed, two of my former staff members who happened to be manning the registration table in Duncan Hall while the rest of us were enjoying the social stopped me enthusiastically and said, hey Chris, how did we do tonight? Did you notice our hospitality? It's all those training meetings that you talked about St. Andre with us, they paid off. Here we have two Notre Dame students who measure good hospitality by a little saint they learned about during summer hall staff training over the past several summers. That same saint not only influenced how I trained summer hall staff members in the spirit of hospitality, but also influences my current work in student discipline. When a student walks into my office to discuss an alleged violation of, say, the alcohol policy, it is my intention that they are met with that same spirit of hospitality that those summer staff members attempt to impart, and that same hospitality that Brother Andre so effectively practiced at those quaint doors in Montreal. Brother Andre was a faithful servant of God with fervent devotion to St. Joseph, and so simply and effectively put Basil Moreau's vision into practice. Although not an academic, and oftentimes in weak or frail health, Andre saw it to that his work as a do doorman, one of the lowliest assignments to be held, would be done so well. I often like to remember the saying, mediocrity is no way to honor the Blessed Mother. And in St. Andre's work, mediocrity was no way to honor St. Joseph. From a simple doorstep came a splendid shrine to show honor to God. Andre's work, life, and message have most certainly influenced my work in Holy Cross. I've incorporated his message of hospitality into every corner of the summer housing program. His spirit lives in the tender moments that students have in my office when they come in vulnerable, afraid, scared, as to how their future will play out since they were caught viol violating a policy. Even if it was a simple beer in the hallway. And I most certainly hope that the model of St. Andre has been evident even in this Holy Cross pre-conference gathering. We may not all come from the same faith traditions or corners of the country, 
But we are gathered here today to celebrate our shared mission and work in Holy Cross. This work has incredibly influenced my vocation as a student affairs educator. Since he wasn't a learned man of the academic sense, St. Andre didn't write much for us to reference in our work today. There is not a piece of his work on your Holy Cross flash drive. However, that's why it's so vital that in our offices, we see his face on a daily basis, like on the small prayer card included in your conference folder. For me, seeing Andre's face reminds me that there is so much more to this work than our administrative life. It has sometimes little to do with assessment or budgets or forms and paperwork, and it has everything to do with the people. From the colleague in the parking lot whom we greet in the morning, to the custodian who keeps our space clean, to the student who runs into us in celebration of an accomplishment, and to, yes, even the student who defies authority over and over again. That student may be the hardest to love. Andre, Moreau, and Christ all call us to that challenge. You see, for me, that's why a saint among us, like Saint Andre, is so important to see every day. One of my favorite quotes of St. Andre comes from when he made a visit to Notre Dame for a Holy Cross gathering some time ago. He was old and very well known at this point in his life. As with any Holy Cross gathering, you can imagine there was food and drink and a festive banquet, and I would imagine cocktails. Many prominent CSCs of the time gave remarks and speeches and went on and on and on about the accomplishments of Holy Cross that particular year. And finally, as the evening drew to a close, one member of Holy Cross got up and recognized Andre for making that incredibly long trip to South Bend from Montreal. The room broke out, speech, speech, speech. And as the story goes, Andre got up slowly, acknowledged his brother's affection, and concluded the evening with the simple line, now, let's go to bed. <laughs> Although the afternoon is still young, and we won't be going to bed quite yet, I hope that my sharing a bit of St. Andre with you can allow you to remember the simplicity of a smile to a student or a colleague, the effectiveness of a quick prayer between meetings, or even when it's time to stop talking and yes, go to bed. Thank you. I'd like us to offer one more collective round of applause to our panelists today. I do thank them for making their time available to us this afternoon.